All right. So uh, welcome everyone uh, to the uh, Microbiome Center seminar. Uh, so this will be sort of our final seminar of the, of the summer session here. And then we'll have a little bit of a break and then get going uh, in, in the fall again uh, with a new slate of exciting talks. Uh, and what, who we have with us today is uh, Javier Del Campo from uh, the University of uh, Miami. Uh, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Marine Biology and Ecology in the Rosenthal School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. And he does a lot of work with uh, some prokaryotic microbes, but a lot of eukaryotic microbes as well. And uh, does lots of cool things with finding novel taxa, performing single cell genomics and all kinds of uh, cool things with these microbes. Uh, and so looks like we're gonna hear about some micro eukaryotes today, which is interesting. So Javier, why don't you uh, take over? Hey, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here. And, and unbelievably, this is my first uh, Zoom uh, talk. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I've been organizing uh, some meetings for a while and I know how it is. I will try to keep it like 40 minutes or more than that because we spend most of our day connected to this camera. So, okay. Um, as my title say, I work on, on coral microbiomes uh, mostly. Uh, and today I will talk about the microchiots associated to corals that are not the social cells. I'm assuming that everybody knows what a social cell is, but for those that do not know, social cells are also known as uh, Symbiodinia CI and are a symbiotic algae of many corals, and they are essential for the coral survival and are the most and most well known uh, microcaryotes uh, associated to corals and the better studied. First of all, okay, let's see. Let's define what a microbial eukaryote or a microcaryote is. So uh, this definition is kind of complicated because the tree of life, uh, the tree of eukaryotic life, uh, as you can see here, it's very diverse. Uh, the way I will define today microcaryotes is everything but animals, plants, and fungi. That will be the most charismatic eukaryotes and that most people work with. And they happen to be um, multicellular. And they happen to represent not, all, not most of the diversity of eukaryotes, despite what we might uh, believe based on publications and the effort that we put on studying them. So most of the eukaryotic uh, diversity, can you see my pointer, my mouse pointer? Yes. Yes. Perfect. yes. Yes. So mo most of the eukaryotic diversity is indeed not multicellular. They are not, not animals, not plants, not fungi. Uh, they are microcaryotes. And they are uh, divided in these seven uh, supergroups. The amoeposoans, that includes uh, no non-parasites like uh, acantamoeba. The excavate, that also includes known parasites like giardia, or the brain-eating amoeba. Archeplastida, that also includes plants, and um, other organisms like um, Chlamydomonas, um, Cara, and others. Uh, Rhizaria, that includes a beautiful uh, radiolarians, as well as foraminifera. Uh, Albiolates, probably one of the most well-known groups of microcaryotes because it includes the, the dinoflagellates, but also the ciliates and the epicomplexans. Then we have the estraminopiles that also includes relevant organisms as diatoms, uh, but also the, the, the brown algae or the golden algae. And opistoconta, this is the group uh, that we belong to, humans, animals, also fungi, but many other uh, microcaryotes as uh, quinoflagellates or, or philosterians or ictosporians. Uh, so this is the, these are the group of organisms that I'm going to be focusing my talk on today. Uh, microcaryotes are, are relevant in the environment, despite they don't have a huge range of metabolic capabilities as prokaryotes do. 
with a couple of things that they can do that would be essentially photosynthesizing and being an heterotroph. They can do many things in the environment. So they can, as I said, they can be photoautotrophs. They can also be mixotrophs that combines photoautotrophy with heterotrophy. And, and they can have different behaviors. Uh, they can be symbionts, they can be predators, they can be parasites, they can also be saprotrophs. And which with all these different behaviors and also the wide size ranges that they present in the within the microbial scale, they play many different roles in the environment and they are crucial for uh, for the for the uh, trophic networks and the microbial loop in in all and in all environments. Uh, as well, they are relevant for for animal and human health as well as relevant for conservation. Uh, around 15, uh, close to 20% of the agents that need to be notified to the World Organization of Animal Health uh, because they cause disease, they happen to be protists and unicellular fungi that I will include as well within the microcaryotes. And within the organisms responsible for species extinction and extirpation, 25% of them are protists and, and the rest are, you, are fungi, most of them unicellular as well, and some of them are non-eucratic pathogens that in this case that means bacteria. So microcaryotes, uh, fungal or protista microcaryotes, they are, they are important uh, ecologically and also they are important for the ecosystem, ecosystem's health. But then if they are important, they are relevant and they are diverse, um, why do we not know that much about them? So there's, there's a huge bias, bias particularly in the, in the omics world, uh, against uh, microcaryotes. So here, uh, this is an example uh, of, uh, of uh, a screening we did on different databases for genomic metabarcoding, that means 16S and for bacteria and 18S for eukaryotes and metagenomics data. Most of the information out there uh, has been generated for bacteria, for prokaryotes. Some are key, but essentially most, most of it for bacteria. For genomics, for, oh, sorry. For, for genomics, for metabarcoding, and also for metagenomics. Among the eukaryotes in the, gen, uh, in, in the genomic databases, most of the information has been generated for plants and animals. And just a little bit for protists and also for fungi, being most of those fungi here, multicellular. Same situation for metabarcoding and for metagenomics. So as you, as you can see, the information we, we have for eukaryotes and in order to contextualize them within uh, the microbiome is, is, is very scarce. And, and there are many reasons for that. One of them would be the, the, the lack of interest compared with bacteria. But eukaryotes and the eukaryon, that it's a term that was coined because, when, because, because we needed it. As a community, the people working on microcaryotes uh, within a host, uh, being it an animal or, or, or a plant, we need that. We need that term because usually, when when people refer to microbiome, they, they think about bacteria. Despite um, microcaryotes are part of the microbiome as well, so we coined the term eukaryon. Despite I think coining all these terms is sometimes unnecessary, just because we wanted to uh, make make sure that people understood what we were working on. So the microcaryotes or eukaryon covers all the symbiotic spectrum. So associated to animals, we find organisms that are mutualists and organisms that are parasites and everything in between. And these um, definitions of parasitism or mutualism are not um, static. That's why we talk about the symbiotic continuum. Some organisms that in certain circumstances, um, depending on their own uh, physiological uh, status and the host physiological status, they are mutualist, but they can uh, become commensalist or they can become parasites, all of them being symbionts. So uh, this again, the same, the same tree I showed you before, where I, 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 I plotted all the microcaryotes that have been positively confirmed to be living within, in this case, anim an animal host. Okay, and the relationship that these organisms have with the animal. They can be 
as, at least based on the literature, because as I said, that's a continuum. Some organisms can change their role from parasites to become mutualists, and I will show you an example later. Uh, but uh, as you can see, they are the finest parasites, common cells, or mutualists. And the distribution of these organisms is not equal across the tree of eukaryotes, and most of them are concentrated here within the excavates, like giardia, like the brain-eating amoeba, and within the alveolates, like dinoflagellates, ciliates, epicomplexans. At this distribution, it's not a natural distribution. This bias is not uh, biological. It's, again, based on, on, inter on our interest as scientists, because these two groups, uh, and also um, somehow uh, opistoconta, particularly for, for microscopic fungi. These, these two groups plus fungi, they concentrate most of the human and animal or farm animal parasites that we have been focusing our interest on for hundreds of years indeed. What about uh, corals? So um, I'm not gonna explain corals to you guys because probably you know about it. So corals, they're animals. What the macroscopic form of, cor of the corals are these, well, the microscopic, the biggest scale form of these corals are these colonies that are formed by tiny little polyps. And what most people know is that these polyps, uh, they are not, they don't live alone. Uh, they, they have these symbionts uh, that I was talking uh, about before, the social chantelids or symbiodinia CI. I'm calling them here symbiodinium. Uh, they have bacteria and they have biases all together or together with the animal, they form the coral holobion. And that's the most common knowledge about corals and their microbiome. But what about other microcarions? So we know there are other microcarions, at least based on the literature. So there are green algae there, like Ostreobium, there are, there are uh, apicomplexans, there are ciliates, uh, and there are other types of heterotrophic microcarions. But we don't know that much. So um, again, this tree, this uh, where, uh, where I plotted all the microcarions that have been described from corals and the groups they belong to. So in total, here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, groups within the eukaryotes uh, that have been described from corals. Uh, these eight groups, they contain 151 species, most of them belonging to fungi, ciliates, and labyrinth through my cities. So if our knowledge about microcaryotes in general is scarce, in, within corals it's even scarcer. So we, we don't know a lot. And most of the information we have comes from uh, isolates that have been characterized through microscopy, and that will be all. However, um, we can use other metho methods to study the, the coral associated uh, microcaryotes. And in this case, uh, I, I, I've been working on using the 16S from actual microbiome studies where people were studying the coral associated bacteria to study microcaryotes. And how? Well, by studying photosynthetic microcaryotes and scavenging all the 16S data from the from algal chloroplast from this uh, microbiome data set. Interestingly, uh, most of the times, this 16S uh, from uh, algal, um, microcaryotic algal chloroplast are, are described as novel cyanobacterial groups in most of the studies. Uh, basically, because the reference databases they use, they didn't include any in the, in some years ago. Now, now it, a couple of years ago, it, it changed with, a, with, a, with the release of a, of a database of chloroplast 16S, but it didn't include uh, chloroplast 16 s so the, the different softwares that we use for microbiome analysis, like Chime or Mothor, they classify those sequences as novel cyanobacteria. Uh, some years ago, I scavenged all these sequences and I, I, I used them to study the diversity and distribution of an endolytic algae uh, called Ostreobium. Uh, Ostreobium is a, is a green algae uh, that belongs to the group, uh, to the Briopsidales. And it has been, it was described uh, 34 years ago uh, 
as, as, a, as a common inhabitant of the, of the coral skeleton. Uh, it also can be retrieved from uh, different types of shells in the ocean. It's a bioodor. It can consume the skeleton, but uh, it has been shown as well that uh, during bleaching events, uh, osteobium can provide photosynthase uh, to corals uh, after uh, the Sogochantella leaves. So it allows the coral to survive uh, for some days until osteobium takes over and kills the coral. Uh, that's why I call osteobium the upper symbiome because if you think about the symbiotic continu continuum, osteobium uh, in normal conditions is just a commensal living here inside the, the, the skeleton of the coral. Uh, when there's a bleaching event and the Sogochantella leaves the coral, uh, it helps the coral providing photosynthesis, providing food, so it becomes a mutualist. And after some days, uh, uh, it can take over and kill the coral by overgrowing it, so it will be considered a parasite. Uh, in, this, in this study, uh, what we did using 16S data was to establish the distribution and diversity of different, of three different uh, groups of osteobium across different reefs. And, and what we observe is that these three groups were not equally distributed across, across reefs and not equally distributed across groups of uh, families of corals. So we assume, but it has to be proved, that there's a, a phylosymbiotic or coevolutionary relation would be maybe too much, but a phylosymbiotic relationship between uh, these groups of oste osteobium and different families of of corals. Uh, we use a similar strategy, so we scavenge a lot of 16S data to study another um, algal lineage associated to um, corals, in this, in this case Chromera, that was a symbiont of corals described in 2008 in a publication in Nature. It was isolated from a, from a coral uh, in, the, in, in Australia. And, and what, it, it was very interesting because uh, this represented back then a new, a new group of algae. After many years of non describing any novel group of algae, this one was extremely novel because it, it seated at the base of the epicomplexans. Uh, the epicomplexans is, the, is a group of microcarriers that includes known, uh, well known pathogens as the malaria agent or toxoplasma. Uh, epicomplexans, they, they contain an uh, an organelle that uh, evolved from a plastic, uh, from, from a plastid, and they use this organelle to invade cells, but they are not photosynthetic. So when Chromera was discovered sitting at the base of, of the epicomplexion, it was very exciting because Chromera is indeed photosynthetic and it's the ancestor of all the epicomplexans. For years, it has been considered that Chromera uh, uh, was or uh, a symbiont of corals, but now it's not that obvious. Uh, when we look, we screen uh, hundreds of microbiome studies looking for uh, 16S data on, uh, from the Chromera chloroplast, and we couldn't find any single 16S from Chromera in the corals we, in, in, in the hundreds of corals we analyzed. We found, we found some 16S from uh, related organism uh, called vitrella that it's as well at the base of the epicomplexans and also from back then a mysterious group of epicomplexan related uh, sequences that we call RL5 that this, were, this was indeed uh, associated to corals, to both coral tissue and coral mucus. When Chromera was retrieved mostly from the biogenous sediment uh, around the coral reef. So in this, in this study what we uh, uh, demonstrated is that Chromera lives in the coral reefs and it probably can be retrieved from the surface of corals, but most of the time it lives uh, in the biogeno sediment. Recent studies have shown that Chromera can infect uh, coral larvae. Uh, so maybe Chromera not being a mutualist as it was uh, suggested, it could be an opportunistic parasite of corals. And, and why we were using uh, 16S to study um, 
the coral microbiome instead of using 18S, that it's the universal barcode that we use commonly to study um, microcaryotes in the environment. So uh, in 2012, the Human Microbiome um, Project paper was published. And after that, many hundreds, I will say thousands of papers or have been published studying the different types of microbiomes, but focusing always uh, and almost exclusively on uh, bacteria. Uh, a year later, uh, a year after the publication of the Human Microbiome um, Consortium paper, there was a commentary on Ismail journal uh, that was called Waiting for the Human Intestinal Eukaryotome. Uh, eukaryotome will be the equivalent of eukaryom, and the name was changed because eukaryotome was extremely ugly and nobody was using it. And I think this is the only publication that used this term. But yeah, Waiting for the Human Intestinal Eukaryom, that was 2013. Uh, in 2014, this paper was published on, on, the, on the communities of microbial eukaryotes in the mammalian gut within the context of environmental eukaryotic diversity uh, using um, a similar approach as it has been used for any other microbiome study using a barcode gene instead of 16S, 18S. But after that, only 13 publications, maybe I look at this last year, so maybe now it's 15 have done that, using the 18S to study the eukaryom in, in, in animals. And why is that? Well, uh, the reason why is because in this paper in 2014, what they, what they realized is that when you use the 18S to study the, the eukaryom, uh, most of your signal comes from the host. Because the problem we have, the people that work with um, microcaryotes, is that the same barcode that we use for to identify uh, microcaryotes uh, is present in all the host cells because they are also eukaryotes. So uh, for, for for the for for the for prokaryotes we use 16s and 23s. Uh, for eukaryotes 18s and 28s, and all the animals, all of them, also all the plants, they have 18s. So when you generate a data set, many times 90% of your data, or even more, it comes from the host. So it it ends up being useless. Within these 13 studies, people, they have uh, tried many different approaches uh, using blocking primers, using um, a combination of primers. Uh, but the problem is that for all these strategies, you have to assign blocking primer for each of your, the hosts you are analyzing, the same with a combination of different primers, and, and that's time consuming. Uh, so, uh, what uh, I did during my postdoc was to try to find a way to study all animals using a single set of primers uh, that we can use for illumina sequencing and amplify the, the 18S. And what I came up with was a set of primers that was published in 2004 to study uh, parasites in fish. And it was also tested in, in other uh, uh, invertebrates, and I thought that this could be a potentially interesting tool to study uh, the eukaryom in animals. So the first thing I did was an in silico test against an 18S database just to determine if these primers indeed excluded the metazoans but included everything else. And that was true. So uh, as you can see here, uh, this is the set of primers. The others are universal primers that we use for, uh, for, for to study microcaryotes in free living environments. And this, just for comparison, are the most popular ones. So this set of primers that, we, uh, that uh, were called UNONMED almost don't amplify any animal, but they perform very well with most of the microcaryotic groups, except for, except for Excavada, uh, but that's an issue that all, all the primers have because Excavada, they have introns uh, within their, their 18S and, and sometimes it's difficult to amplify, well, many times it's difficult to amplify them. After this in silico test, uh, well, this is, this is the amplification within animals, also in silico. So you see that among those, uh, among, among that 
around 5% of the sequences from the database. Most of those sequences belong to Porifera. Uh, so this set of primers was not, it's not, it was not gonna be used for Porifera. And some amplified Nidaria, most of them being mixosons, that is a type of Nidarian uh, parasite. After this in silico test, we, we did an in vivo test with uh, different tenophores, uh, corals, and humans. And what we observe here in red, this is the, the signal coming from the host. And in any other color, all the other microcarriers present in the sample, in the samples. So, for example, for tenophora, despite in silico, the, the, it was supposed to amplify, to, to amplify many, uh, we recovered uh, essentially only host. The reason why is that we only use two species of tenophora, so maybe for other species, uh, the situation will be different. For Nidaria, most of the signal we retrieve correspond to, uh, to microcarriots, in this case, alveolates. And for humans, the situation was very similar. Uh, here, I will show you the comparison between using universal primers versus these uh, contrametasone primers. Per, per, per sample. So you see here that most, most of the samples that contain animal signal, because some of them didn't, were essentially and mostly animal. When we use uh, non metason primers, we decrease the host signal by 13 by 11, the, the less was by, by half or, or, or dramatically. So we proved that this set of primers were potentially useful for many animals from Nidarians to humans. Uh, so that's what we did. We started using this set of primers. We, we started with corals. We analyzed 46 samples uh, uh, corresponding to 32 species of corals, belonging to 30 different families from four locations. And what we observed is that the diversity we could recover Compared with the diversity that has been reported so far for microcarriots within corals, it's, it's, it's really dramatic. So what we can observe using uh, 16S uh, metabarcoding is much, much more diverse than what we can observe using um, microscopic isolation and observation. But not only is a matter of diversity, but it's also that now we have the capacity of quantifying considering the limitations of, of meta recording for quantification uh, and easily screening many, uh, or quantify the presence of, of different organisms and screening many, many uh, different uh, samples while looking at under the microscope, it's very time consuming. So it will take uh, a long time. And now I, I would like to focus on the API complexions that it's one group that we found particularly interesting uh, within corals. So uh, we know about coral apicomplexion since um, uh, 1988 when uh, this organism called Gemocystis cylindricus was uh, is uh, isolated and characterized uh, from a coral by Apton et al. After that, we have seen, uh, we have reported um, signals or molecular signals from um, apicomplexions from corals using uh, metabarcoding primers, both 16S and 18S. For 16S, uh, I already talked about it. Uh, uh, this group called Apicomplex and Related Lineages 5 have been reported again and again from different corals in different areas of the wall. And this, uh, and for 18S, this uh, group called type N has been reported as well. All these three types of inf information could not be connected to each other because uh, the approaches that were used for to retrieve the information were different. But by adding, by using this um, new set of primers, we could analyze uh, many different corals and we observe that 70% of the analyzed coral samples, they contain this um, uh, apicomplexin signal uh, because we were using 18S, it corresponded to this type N. And in some cases, up to 50% of the eukaryotic reads that we recovered corresponded to this type N, competing in, in many cases against, against the solution telite itself. Uh, combining the 16S data with uh, the 18S data here with 16S data, we could determine that 
many times uh, the 16S uh, barcode corresponding to Earl 5 and the 18S barcode corresponding to type N, they co accord We observe that also in coral metagenomes. So we assume that type N and Earl 5 were the same type of organism or correspond to the same organism. Uh, we analyzed many corals uh, from different areas of the, of the tree of the, of, of, the, of the Nidarians and almost all, all, all the big groups of, 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 of anthozoans contain these uh, apicomplexans. Uh, we also use um, fish to determine where they, they were located uh, within, within the corals. And here they are in red in the mesenterial filaments. Here you, you see the nematocyst and here in blue all these dots correspond to the, to the Cinderinia CI. Uh, this this uh, fish probe is based on 16S, so it identifies uh, RL5, but we also develop an 18S probe to uh, identify uh, type N and both, both signals co-occur. So using FISH, we could confirm that both RL5 and type N are the same organism. As well, using TM, we could characterize the ultrastructure of, of this um, coral apicomplexum that we named coral ecolid. And despite we cannot say for sure if it's Gemocystis cylindricus, it looks like an apicomplexum. So easily it could be Gemocystis cylindricus. When, uh, when we look at the, at the genomic data, we observe, first of all, this group of, of coral-related apicomplexans or coral eucalyptus. They are related to coccidians that are well-known parasites. Um, and, and surprisingly, they contain all the genes needed for chlorophyll biosynthesis, but none of the, of the genes of the, of the photosystem. So, despite they can produce chlorophyll, they cannot photosynthesize. So we don't know exactly what they are using the chlorophyll for. Um, it has to, maybe they came up with another use for it. Well, they, they should have, because otherwise, why uh, generating all this, all this chlorophyll uh, for nothing? Uh, this, this capacity has been recently reported as well uh, by Ileana Bombs and in a, in a set of deep water corals where for sure they do not uh, photosynthesize and they have reported the presence of these epicomplexans as well and they have reported the presence of these four chlorophyll biosynthesis genes as well. So just to give you an idea where these symbionts are, these are the, this is the Coral apicomplexan tree uh, represented um, uh, by the worst diseases they cause malaria, toxoplasma, diarrhea, barcryptosporidium. Uh, here we have other invertebrate parasites. Here we have Chromera that it might or might not be a coral symbiont. And here we have the coral ecolids that they are within toxoplasma and diarrhea. But it has not been proof that they are pathogenic. And indeed, by by their, their uh, abundance and by how widespread they are, Probably they are not. But as I said, the, the symbiotic continue can, I mean, you can be a parasite one day and you can become a mutualist another day. Also, we use this, uh, this set of primers to explore um, the microbiome of the Gorgonian, of the Red Gorgonian Paramoisea clavada and how it, it changes uh, in response to thermal stress. Uh, we sample sites, uh, a population of Gorgonians in five different uh, areas of the Mediterranean. And for our preliminary study, we analyzed two of them in Medes, number one, and Portofino in Italy. So we, we sample, um, we sample uh, three link apical tips of the Gorgonians, one that we use for control, and B that we use as a treatment in a common garden experiment, and, and C that we kept for, for, to, to study the microbiome and to do transcriptomics. So the common garden experiment consisted on keeping the, 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 the gorgonians in tanks, the controls uh, were kept at 18 degrees, and, and their treatment was, uh, 
was kept at 25 degrees. The reason why we did that is because in the Mediterranean, uh, uh, the, heat heat, the heat wave of 2017 killed uh, many Gorgonians, and Gorgonians are one of the most charismatic uh, corals in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, they, are, they are builders of the coral igenous, and they are important for the ecosystem. So we wanted to understand why and how that happened. Uh, after 14 days of keeping those corals at 25 degrees, then we, we studied the, 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 ne the, necrotic, uh, the, the percentage of necrosis within the tissue because these, these gorgonians, they don't bleach like the, like the tropical corals or so, so chantelate corals, but they necrose uh, under high temperature conditions. And we wanted to understand why that was happening. So uh, based on the percentage of necrosis, we classified the, the, the corals in, in five different groups. So resistant to necrosis, uh, they present no, no necrosis after 14 days at 25 degrees. Less than 25% necrosis, we call them normal R. Between 25 and 75, we call them normal. More than 75% necrosis, we call them normal S. And 100% necrotic, so dead, we call them sensible. So we, based on that, we, we analyzed the, the initial sample we took before this common garden experiment, and we analyzed the microbiome. And we uh, organized the microbiome data based on these different uh, groups, uh, based on the resistance. And we analyzed the bacteria. Uh, as you can see, first we did the test. We, when you keep the corals in this uh, common garden experiment, you feed them because otherwise they will die. Um, and we fed them with, with cyclops. So we compared the, coral, the, the microbiome of the coral with the microbiome of the cyclops and the microbiome of the surrounding water. And first of all, we confirmed that they are different, so we could keep going. And then we compare the different um, groups that we, we form based on their sensi sens sensibility to temperature. And in the case of bacteria, uh, there are not clear differences across the different groups. But then uh, that changed uh, when we look at the microcarions. So again, we did this test to compare the differences between the, the coral, the food, and the water. So they are different. We can keep going. And what we observe here is that, first of all, the coral ecolids are the most dominant group of microcarions within uh, Paranguisia clavada, by far. But interestingly, in the resistant and the normal resistant corals, we reported a lot of dinoflagellates and also a lot of Suecii. Suecii, that's the group where the symbiodinids, so the social telids, belong to. Uh, that will not be surprising for a tropical hard coral, but Paramoisia clavada is a, it's, it's a Gorgonian, and those organisms are also chantilly. So that's the first time I showed this data, but it's what it is, and we have looked at it many times, and it's like that. Again, if we look uh, more in detail, um, in the case of bacteria, uh, essentially endosycomonas, that it's a well-known coral associated bacteria dominates uh, in all the situations. Uh, in particular, there's one single ASB that it's the most prevalent. In the case of, of microcaryotes, what we see is that, uh, first of all, this, um, this, uh, this symbiodinia CI, this Suecialis are indeed symbiodinium clade A, uh, now called simply symbiodinium, that it's a, 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 a social teller, and it represents 20% 20, 20%, and it's a single, it's a single um, ASV or OTU, represents 20%, 20 percent of all, all the microcarriots in the normal resistant um, uh, paramoliceas, and they are also present uh, in the resistant ones. As well, the main difference between sensible and resistant is that there, there is an increase in the diversity of organisms within uh, the resistant um, colonies. So for Paramoisia clavada, what we see is that resistance to uh, thermal stress is more linked to microcarriots than it is to bacteria. And surprisingly, it is linked to the presence of symbiodinium and as well to the presence of other type of dinoflagellates that are represented here that are called sininiales. So 
Sindinialis are, are commonly described as parasites of many organisms, including copepods, including corals, and including other dinoflagellates, like, for example, Symbiodinium itself. So we don't know what the role of this Sindinialis might be uh, within this, the, the coral microbiome, uh, but uh, we will need to explore that. Regarding Symbiodinium, um, it is very unlikely that Symbiodinium is a, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a coral um, symbiont in this case. I mean, it has never been described before, but we are looking at tissue and we are trying to determine if Symbiodinium is indeed within the tissue of those resistant um, corals, um, Gorgonians. But it's known as well that Symbiodinium is present as a symbiont of other microcaryotes. And in this case, who knows, maybe Symbiodinium is a symbiont of ciliates that we also reported within within corals, or, or well, we don't really know. This is uh, this is really exciting, and as soon as as, as I get uh, images, I will I will be happy to share those with whoever is interested on in that. I would like to finalize with a very very preliminary data that we have generated in the lab. Apart from using uh, metabar coding, we are also very interested in studying um, uh, the coral um, at the single cell level. And we are using uh, 10X single cell transcriptomics to study uh, bleaching in two Caribbean corals, um, Oricella fabulata and Acropora cervicornis. And this is the preliminary data we just obtained one month ago from Orbicella fabulata. Uh, it doesn't show much, uh, but that we have that uh, we are able to differentiate different uh, cell, cell populations within Orbicella fabulata based on their transcriptomic profile. And as well, we have been able to characterize the, the, sim, the Symbiodini ACI populations within, within the coral. Um, this is, this is based on an alternative approach for the uh, annotation of these of this, uh, single cell transcriptomes that instead of using only a reference genome for the organism we are studying, we combine uh, different genomes into a single reference data set in order to characterize not only the cells from the animals, but also the cells from every putative symbiont. We also try to retrieve apicomplexans from this uh, data set but we had some problems, so we didn't retrieve enough cells. That's because we use a physical uh, strategy to separate uh, cells from, from, from the, the coral cells in order to analyze them using uh, uh, the 10x uh, single cell uh, transcriptomics platform. But now we are moving to a chemical dissociation strategy that uh, is um, generating a higher uh, output in terms of numbers of cells. So we are positive that soon we will be able to see more cells and by seeing more cells, we will be able to also observe other types of symbionts apart from the Symbiodinia CI. But being able to observe the Symbiodinia CI and the, and the coral cells linked to those symbionts, it's already very exciting. So I would like to finish with this slide. Uh, and this is the take home message from my talk. Microcaryotes are part of the microbiome too, not only within corals, but within every other organism. So uh, don't forget to study uh, microcaryotes as well, not only bacteria. I do exactly the same. So I come from the microcaryotic world and now I'm incorporating bacteria to my studies because I think we should be studying the microbiome as an integral system, including every possible member from microcarids to viruses uh, and bacteria. Uh, I would like to thank uh, everybody in my lab, in particular, Anthony Bonacolta, that he has been doing most of the work on Paramorizea and also on, on single cell transcriptomics. All my collaborators, all the funding agencies, and thank you for being here uh, and listening to my talk. And I think I'm done. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I, I had not thought about how much untapped like material is there.
So I'm open for questions if somebody has any question. I try to keep that on time, 43 minutes, so. Yes, we have some time for questions. Um, if anyone wants to share them or ask them now, feel free, or you can type them in the chat, and I'm happy to read them as well um, from the chat. Thank you, Javier, very, very good talk. Thank you. I had a question. Uh, so early on, you were talking about um, using the 16S from the chlor chloroplast uh, for doing sort of your uh, phylogenomic analysis, and then uh, sort of transition to using these 18S primers that were uh, excluding metazoans and things like that. I is it possible to get to use both approaches and get some complementary information, or are there advantages and disadvantages to the to the two different uh, approaches there? Well, we, we did that for the picomplexion study that we published last year uh, in mm -hmm. order to integrate the previous knowledge. So, apicomplexins complexions were described using 16S, and they were named Errol 5. They were described using 18S. They were they, they were named Type N, and we combined this information. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and this can be done, and and the information we retrieve. I don't know if it's complementary, but it's interesting to have both. But you can do that only for uh, organisms with a chloroplast. And that's the main limitation. So um, you can work with uh, things that have a chloroplast and you can characterize um, uh, the, mi the microcreatic community that, that has a chloroplast or a derived chloroplast or something like that. And as well, um, by doing that, you are indeed a scavenging data. So most of the 16A data from microbiome studies, uh, they, they, build, they correspond to bacteria. So the proportion that corresponds to uh, chloroplasts is not that big. And, and, and you need to do like, I mean, the studies I presented on osteobium and, and chromerids uh, or apicomplex and related lineages, we analyzed, I mean, hundreds of samples and we combined everything together in order to observe patterns and, and, and to build trees. So are you just limited to the chloroplast? Because what about mitochondrial DNA? The signal from the mitochondrial um, uh, small subunit is not as, as good. Okay. It's not as good. I mean, I've tried, I can tell you. I mean, you can, you can see it. You can see the mitochondria. You can. But it's not as good, not for all the groups as well. And, 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 and again, uh, not all the groups have <laughs> mitochondria. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they have, um, there's only one group of microcreatids that has no mit mitochondria at all, only one, only one organism in the spread. But there are others that have other type of mitochondria that have been very reduced, and those don't even have the a small subunit to look at. So there's also a limitation, but all microcreatids, they have an 18S. 18S though has other problems, like the copy number. So the copy number of the 18S can go from 10 to 12,000. So quantifying using this technique, it's almost impossible. We have another question from Monica Medina in the chat. She thanks you for a great talk and is wondering whether you know if the facultative I'm going to mispronounce this, osteobium turns parasitic after a bloom and what might control those dynamics? I, I, I use the term parasitic because I think it's the best term I could use, but osteobium only does its thing. So if, uh, the, the, when there's a bleaching event, um, okay, let's just start at the beginning. So the light that osteobium uses Mostly it's on the red spectrum. And that's the light that osteobium can get being below all the tissue and being below all the symbiotinids, okay? So its capacity to grow with, with this light is, let's say, normal. Osteobium can use any other type of light and has uh, many, I mean, many systems to protect itself against an excess of light and when, and, and when, when um, the symbionids leave during a bleaching event, osteobium starts to photosynthesize like crazy, like crazy. Then 
it has to grow. And what it will do, it will initially it will provide photosynthesis to the coral because that's what it's going to be doing. But at some point, it's going to overgrow the coral and killing the coral. So the only way to prevent that is by the, the symbiote needs to return and keep taking the light that uh, now Australia is taking and is using to overgrow the coral. If they return, Australia will have to keep using the, the light on the red spectrum and its growth is gonna be limited by that. So that's the only reason why Australia becomes a parasite. But because all these concepts of parasitism and mutualism, it are very anthropogenic. So we define what's a parasite, what's not. I mean, Australia is not bad, it's just doing its thing and <laughs> yeah, that happens. Wonderful, thank you. Are there any other additional questions from anyone? Either in the chat or feel free to share now. I actually had another question um, about your, your one, I think it was Coralacola that had the, the chlorophyll biosynthetic genes, but not the uh, photosystem ones. Yeah. Do, do you have any speculation about what, what the role is there? No. I, I mean, yeah, well, I have a broader speculation about what every epicomplexan does with its plastic that it's infecting other stuff. And they have, they have reused their plastic genes to create this apicoplast that they use to infect their host cells. Uh, I'm assuming that these coralicolids have also refurbished these um, chlorophyll genes for this purpose. Did you, have you looked at the chlorophyll genes themselves to see if they're divergent from other chlorophyll genes? Uh, well, they are divergent, but not too divergent. They are easily recognizable as mm. the, the LIPOR complex genes and ACSF. So, um, yeah, that they are not they're super derived. So that's, that's kind of, yeah, it's, the, it's a mystery, <laughs> let's say, the way. And also, it has been reported again um, by, by, by Liana Bombs when they were analyzing uh, metagenomic data from, from deep sea corals and they were reconstructing the plastids from these uh, coral ecolids. They were also there and down there, they for sure were, they were not photosynthesizing because our data set, it came from shallow water. So there was a possibility that they were using these corals for something related with light. I these corals, this chlorophyll uh, for something related uh, with light, but not, uh, in this new, in this data set analyzed by 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 Liana Bams, they, they they shouldn't be using that for light related stuff. So we don't know. Yeah, I was wondering about maybe some sort of defense against oxidizing mechanisms or something like that. I, yeah. I, I don't know. That, that yeah, that could that, that's also an option. Yeah, but. We have a couple more questions in the chat, Javier, if that's okay. Yeah, um, sure, yeah, yeah. Someone is wondering whether you have any hypotheses about why these organisms can produce chlorophyll but don't photosynthesize. As I said, I mean, our assumption is that they are refurbishing the, this set of genes for some, of, some type of invasive purpose to be able to uh, infect um, corals because that's what has happened with every with the rest of the of the of the chloroplast in other apicomplexans but that's just an assumption and it's not based on any kind of data um, it's all speculation but as as Darrell said it could be also related to uh, controlling uh, oxygen reactive species and stuff like that that makes sense. Um, and Kadeem Gilbert asks if the reason that metazoan exclusive primers didn't work well on, um, was because of the phylum's basal position in metazoa. You mean for porifera? For the um, tenophora. Tenophora. Well, for tenophora, I think that the problem is that our, our range of species was too, um, too small, so we only tested two species. I, I'm pretty sure that for tenophora, it will work well for others. But yes, uh, the, the three basal groups of metazoans, well, for porifera it works horribly bad, and probably because they are the base of the tree of the metazoans. Well, I, I, 
some people may believe the tenophora are, but hey, that's not my discussion. That's not my work. But both of them are basal. So, and, and Nidaria as well, they're relatively basal. So and I think that might be the reason. Because when we design these type of primers, uh, I mean, you need to take compromises. You need to make compromises. And, and, and in order to include as many uh, microcarts as possible and to exclude as many uh, metasons as possible, sometimes you have to exclude one basal group of of metasans because it's closer related to to the microcaryote. So yeah, that might be the reason. But again, for tenophora, I think that if we test more, we will see that for certain species, these primers will work because in silico, there's no doubt that for tenophora are not that bad. But I don't work with tenophora, so I've never I've never kept testing. Wonderful, thank you. Well, are there any last questions that anyone has for Javier? If not, thank you so much. This was a very interesting talk and we really appreciate your time. Thank you all for being here and for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Great. And for those of you participating in the Kickstart workshop, we will resume at one o'clock with the uh, with the original link so see you then and uh yeah thank, thanks a lot javier that, that was great I, i'm not leaving because you made me host and i don't want to just destroy the oh, okay. <laughs> so just let me know when when i should leave otherwise i will stay yeah i'll just wait a second to see if there was anyone that just wanted to hang around and chat for a second sometimes that happens so we'll just I'm, yeah, I have all day. I just booked all day for this, so. <clears throat> I'm gonna take off now, but I will see you later, Javier. We have some time later this afternoon. Okay. Bye all, have a good weekend. Bye. Bye, you as well. Oh, and there's a question here about cultivation of the complexants in vitro. Uh, yeah, oh, there are, so I'm not sure who that is, but, but that, Mac six six seven eight. So <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean they can be cultured. Uh, it, it's it, it's being done for different types of apicomplexants, including I don't know, um, cryptosporidium. It can be done as well for plasmodium, and I know that there's a there's people in the UK working on gregorines that are invertebrate parasites. They're trying to um, establish cultures with them as well. And here we are trying as well. So um, uh, in collaboration with Nikki Taylor Knowles, um, um, we are gonna try to inoculate um, uh, cells that contain the, the, the corolicolids on cell tissue cultures uh, from Pocinopora, Namicornis. And let's see if we can establish a, a culture. I don't think it's gonna be easy, but at least we have the tools to try. All right, well, yeah, I gotta run because I gotta go feed, feed my kids some lunch, but uh... Thank you so much for uh, coming in and uh, doing this. Very oh, interesting. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Have a nice weekend. You yes, too. thanks very much. You too. Bye. Take care, everyone. Be well. <laughs>